something. I don't know what's I'm going not, on. Exactly. Yeah. I said the same thing. Okay. All right. Uh, good evening and welcome to the, what is today? Tuesday, June 13th, 2023 meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. Um, we will quickly review our agenda, if I can find it. I'm the only one prepared today. Well, I know the first thing is going to be that we allow a period for public comment. At the moment, it does not appear we have anybody here from the public to comment. Um, so following it, we're going to actually table the review and approval of both meeting minutes and invoices, and we will tackle those at our next meeting. Um, we will do a recap of the community forum. We will have a discussion of the project costs and some of the key ESBC decisions to date that have driven the cost. Um, a question that we've gotten quite frequently is what happens if this project is unsuccessful? So we're going to give some information as to um, what the impacts of that would be. We'll review an updated landscape and site plan. Um, we will have a second look at exterior materials with the goal of voting on which exterior materials we are going to use by the end of this meeting. And then, I guess having settled exterior materials, we'll move inside and look at interior materials for what the options are there. And then our upcoming meeting schedule. So hopefully to wrap up right around 8 o'clock. Um, so we did have a community forum on uh, last week on Wednesday night, and it was um, one of our, it was our best attended community forum. I think the virtual uh, format really supports getting greater engagement, and we had a lot of Q&A, uh, especially around the cost and um, the traffic aspects of the project. So it was great to have the amount of community engagement we had, and hopefully we were able to answer a lot of their questions. Um, the one topic that's been brought up to me a couple of times related to community forums that we should uh, put on the agenda somewhere as a group is, I don't think we have any more community forums scheduled, and so we need to remedy that, because I think we should be having a lot more community forums. It was clear from that discussion that People are interested in more information and the opportunity to interact with us, um, which if anyone is watching, I'll remind you, you can always do by coming to our meetings and participating in public comment or emailing us at esbc2 at hopkintonma.gov. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on the forum? So following the forum, um, we were able to repost to many social media groups, um, the YouTube recording, um, so we'll be able to track additional views and hopefully that will disseminate more information. You can also fast forward to a part of the meeting that you're particularly interested in. Um, there's been some discussion on some of the groups on Facebook specifically, um, asking about updating the FAQ document. Um, so if people wanted to f have just some quick snippets of information, I think it's probably time for us to go ahead and update that document with some of the common questions we're receiving in the, in the last forum. Um, so hopefully we can do that yep. soon as well and update it on the website. Um, there's definitely a lot of people talking about it in town. Which is good. It's a positive That's what we thing. Want. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? All right, so moving right along, um, we're going to talk about project cost. Um, this, is, I th this is obviously not the first time we've had a discussion like this, and it was a topic we covered at the community forum, but this is obviously and clearly a topic that is very important to the taxpayers, but also, I mean, extremely important to the committee, who is the voting members are made up of taxpayers. And so um, we recognize that this project is significantly more expensive than previous projects that have occurred in town. So I think we're going to take as many opportunities as we can to help explain both why that is and also all of the actions we're taking to really make sure that we can keep that cost reined in and keep the taxpayer at the at forefront of the discussion. So um, Chris, am I turning this over to yep. you? Okay. I went by the logo on the slide. <laughs> um, so in terms of cost, some of this, if you viewed the forum, is uh, the same content, but we thought it was appropriate to just um, recap the, some of the points we raised for this committee for discussion. 
um, because one of the questions that we the ESBC has already gotten multiple times is how does Elmwood compare to this? How does it compare to that in terms of other schools that the MSBA has done in the area? And so we thought that it made sense to revisit this topic um, for today's meeting. So one of the points we raised is that every project is different, that the MSBA program is a framework, but it's a framework that they've designed to customize to the individual district. And the goal of customizing it to the individual district is that every district has the um, option to educate their students as they see fit. It's locally controlled by the school board and by the superintendent in that district and through the way that they develop their curriculum. And so the educational plan is really what informs a particular school's approach to education. And the MSBA's program uses that as the framework to design the school for that educational plan. And so when you're looking at two different districts, how they educate their students may differ from one to another, and the facilities that they need to support that may differ from one to another. So you don't always see that when you're just saying, I heard that Swampscott was a lot cheaper than our school, because they might do something differently or need a facility that's different than what the town of Hopkinton needs. Can I ask a question? That's a very interesting point. Can you give us some examples of the differences you folks see out there, and is ours Better isn't the right word, but how is ours different from others? You so a big one that we see is the size of the classroom, the intended size of the classroom. That can have a huge impact on how many classrooms you need to support your student population. If you have a specific target in mind, that's going to influence how many <laughs> classrooms you need to teach your students. I'm um, trying to think of some of the other ones that you've seen over the There's years. A variety of fit and finish, you know, so a lot of the building blocks aren't the same with the number of classrooms. You could get to a tipping point where you have either an oversized gym or undersized. Once you hit a certain threshold, you need a larger space. And so that's true with cafeterias and things like that. So the general dollars per square foot is a universal metric, but kind of where you land on that, you could be the high end of a spectrum or the low end of a spectrum just because of the way your enrollment shook out with all those extra exterior spaces. The site itself is a huge differentiator. Uh, you guys have a Greenfield site that's at the back, uh, set far back from the roadway. Other projects are building the classic build behind, where the site's already fully developed. You have roadways, you have parking, you may just be replacing the building itself versus all the accoutrements that are supporting that school itself. So because you guys are building a new location, you're, you're starting from scratch for some of those other projects have a natural efficiency. Uh, that, that reaches up to utilities as well, right? If you've got to bring all the utilities in, doing a greenfield site is different than those the classic built behind. Um, lately, sustainability goals have changed. Uh, that's a constant conversation. All the town meetings that have occurred throughout the state this past May, many of them had similar warrants the way you guys did about making commitments to net zero, getting rid of gas. And so where you make those decisions along the way makes a difference in where you uh, where your dollars per square foot. So if you look back two years, many towns weren't doing that. If you look back five years, no towns were doing it. So as you look at your peers, you're all moving on this journey together. So it's it's a moment in time in ways like that. And you know, towns are making important decisions like you guys did with geothermal. There are much larger rebates available based on that October Inflation Reduction Act that weren't available in 2022. So even if you compare yourself to last year, people are making different decisions because of the different programs that are available. So those are just a couple of examples of your peers may be different. S STE spaces are another one. It's a relatively new idea in a lot of schools that were built 30, 40 years ago. And some schools have further advanced what their STE program is. Some schools are still developing what their STE program is. And so those variations dictate the type of space they might need to build for that specific um, element of the school. And STE being science, technology, engineering. Correct. So it just for not everybody may be familiar with that. Well, thanks. And I think that's probably a question we're going, we could get um, at one of the upcoming forums. So thanks for uh, clarifying. Yeah, I think that's important when you, you know, when you get to town meeting and you find those comparable projects, it's really understanding what towns have the same needs you know, that your town has, and what towns have the same criteria that led to the decisions you guys led to. And we talk about those as comparables. You can pull any job as a school and say it's a comparable, but that's not a full story. We need to make sure we have the full story for the public. And I will say that this is a, we've gotten several questions of 
that what about this school? And so I do want to thank both Vertex and Perkins Eastman who have been res were very responsive to the questions of, can you guys give me some context as to why this, what, what are the differences that we can respond to those community members? So that's been really helpful. The, the, the other big one that um, a community member might see that should be explained is charter schools. Charter schools operate under a different outline and framework. So they don't have the same standard that a public school in the MSBA program would need to meet. And so that can directly affect the um, costs as well. And what he means by that is that, you know, a town is building a school as an investment for 50 years. It's an asset, it's something you hold on to, where, you know, a charter school is more of a commodity, right? They're buying it for the, the shorter term, you know, 20 year horizon. Charter schools are popping up all over the place. They're gaining momentum. But they're not thinking about a school that I'm building for 50 years. They're talking about the first 10 years, and then they're looking at the next 10 years after that. They may move. Many charter schools start in one location in rented space and then move on as funding arrives for those types of uh, programs. So it's a different mindset that goes with that type of application. Um, another important point to bring up as it relates to comparing school to school is that um, when we estimate a school, so when we're talking about Elmwood, we're not talking about buying Elmwood today. We're talking about buying Elmwood in two years. And so we have to escalate based on where we think the market is going versus previous bids where we know what the market was at at that time and we know how that building was made at that time. Over the last two years, we've seen huge fluctuations in costs, individual costs of a building. But those individual cost fluctuations have happened at different times. Glass has been up 40% at one time versus another. Sheet metal has been up 30% at one time versus another. There was a period of time two years ago where wood doubled. And so depending on where that was in the bidding cycle of those other schools, that influenced the cost that they were at at those particular times. And schools that were before that giant rise are obviously going to have lower bids because they didn't know that that huge escalation was coming. Another important point to bring up, and this may seem obvious to somebody who deals with it a lot, but you see it on the news. Like today it came out, inflation is only up 4%. And so what does that mean? What it means is that we're up 4% versus last year. But if you're looking over two years, you have to look at what was inflation doing a year ago? Because versus two years, it may not be that we just went up, say, let's say we went up 10 last year. You didn't go up 14, you went up 4% of 10 this year. And so when you look at the last four years and you see that inflation was 2%, then 8%, then 12%, then 6%, you can't just add that together and say that's where we are. It compounds each year. And each year of that compounding means that we're up 30.8% 30 30 over that four-year period, which is a significant amount when you're talking a million dollars. And I think that's really helpful because when we talk about people trying to do comps, the the most frequent comp we get is Marathon because it opened not that long ago. I mean, that school opened in 2018, so we bid it in 2016 or 17, right? So, but even you just go back four years and the construction costs have have inflated by 31%. So you take that Marathon number and you basically, if you were building it today, have to go up by even more than 31% on those costs if we were building that building today. That's just how much the environment has changed. And the other thing to keep in mind, um, so the last point here, is that the MSBA provides you a template, but that template, like the educational program, gets customized to the district. And so the district can make decisions about how many times they want to serve lunch, how many times they want to have gym, based on the number of students they have, and that can manipulate what that template is. There's also certain aspects of the MSBA space program that the district can customize based on their unique circumstance. So you're still providing two sinks in every room, which the MSBA wants you to do, and other things that the MSBA wants you to do so that you can participate in their program and get the, I think, 25% reimbursement that Hopkinton is in the, the neighborhood of. But it's by following those rules specific to your district. And so that can influence where the, um, the school ends up. So a certain size school is going to have facilities that support what the MSBA wants to build in the new schools they're producing for the next 50 years. So when you look at the next slide, 
Um, this is taken directly off. Um, this is actually an interactive chart that you can look at on the MSBA website. And we thought it was helpful because it puts in perspective the trend. And we think that you sort of see a couple of different things. So if you go to the next one, we dropped a trend line on it so that you could get a sense of sort of where's that critical mass of schools been over time. And as you look at this, you can really clearly see that, you know, for a period of time, construction inflation was fairly standardized. So it's a subtle curve. It was slightly upticking for a number of years, going all the way back to um, 2009 on this chart. And what we've seen over the last year, or the last four years really, is that inflation with the pandemic suddenly took off. And that compounding of inflation also took off. And so you can see that the um, bid results that they were getting in 21 into 22 were relatively close. It was a wide spread because every district is different and the priorities of every project is different, but it still was in a relatively tight range year to year. And then what you can see is that as you approach the, the schools that were aiming to come online in 2023, um, or to, to go to bid in 2023, suddenly that range exploded. And it's significantly larger range. And that's the amplification that that inflation has on all of those projects. They were pursuing more sustainable ideas, but they're also seeing huger spreads because of the volatility of those construction prices. And when you look from 23 to 24, you start to see that the bottom of that range steps up significantly. And that's reflective of the fact that all construction prices have stepped up. So even though you're going back to a tightening of the overall range that those schools exist in, you're not seeing the wide spreads of, I think this goes from close to $1,000 a square foot all the way down to um, like 425. That range is tightening again in those schools to come online in 24, similar to where it was a few years ago, but the whole range has stepped up. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, for those who might not be able to see it, I don't know how clear it is on the screen, but to the y-axis on that, the cost is, the, is that cost construction cost per square foot that Jeff was referencing yes. earlier, so you can kind of normalize it. And I think it's worth pointing out, too, when, you know, to keep this in context, because I think there has been some discussion we heard at the forum of, are we going for sort of significant luxury in this school? You can see that red circle, yeah. right? I mean, we're, for, in Hopkinton, we're pretty much right on in the middle of the other projects that are it at our stage in an MSBA process. So I, I think that's worth noting. I actually went online. This is an interesting chart. Uh, it's interactive, as, as you pointed out. And I'm curious, the outlier there that's still being projected at around $530 a square foot. I clicked on, and I think it was Revere High School, which that's ours. you folks are involved. Can mm -hmm. you help me understand what the outlier is there on that? Yeah. Um, so that building actually, it's oh, 300 and almost 400,000 square feet. It has a underground parking for the entire building. It's, a, so it's, it's in a floodplain, so the building's raised up 15 feet. So that un, we decided under, underneath should be parking because it's you have to raise it up 15 mm -hmm. feet anyway. When it was put forth to MSBA, they felt that was part of the square footage. So they took the so the parking is factored in. So the parking doesn't really cost anything. So the okay. parking drags that number way down. It's more. It's closer to eight hundred dollars a square foot if you take the parking. Okay. okay. That's a prime example. Where there's got to be a real comparable because unless you knew that story, which I did, you know, it really actually deters what that comparison. Well, is. I even took it a step further and went into their town meeting to find out what they approved, and they didn't mention that. At least what I read. But it also said the real number is like three hundred million for the school they're building. Is that because they had three thousand students it's or four thousand students or four hundred million? It's, okay. it's, it's four hundred and ninety. Okay. Yeah, that's two different sets of numbers. That and I appreciate and that. just in general, you do see higher cost per square foot on um, high schools okay. yeah. versus yeah. lower grades, it's just because the. Yeah degree of stuff that goes into them. Um, the programs are a little more advanced. They sometimes like better science, better engineering and technology, and that does cost money. Okay. Um, so does this also reflect <clears throat> there are not as many new construction, the image for that, just the little plus signs. Does this reflect that M the MSBA is accepting more projects in as well since the cost has gone higher? 
so that we're f there are fewer people who are in this stage because less projects were accepted? I can speak to a little yeah, bit of that, and Jeff we'll may want that as one. well. Um, actually, there are slightly fewer projects that are entering the MSBA pipeline. The MSBA voted to um, uh, extend the dollar per square foot amount, even though it doesn't at all keep pace with const actual construction costs. It's just a, a matter of distributing more funds toward the construction cost rather than, uh, rather than uh, maintain the same number somewhere north of 12 to 15 projects a year. So it, it'll be more like 10 to 12 projects per year. At least that's the, the moment we're in. So and it's actually tougher to get into the MSBA pipeline now. Yeah, one of the questions we had at the forum was like, if this didn't, if this weren't to pass, and I just think it's important to know that if for some reason this weren't to pass, there's a very slim, if zero, possibility that we'd be able to work with the MSBA again to receive any type of reimbursement funding. Like we'd be I think less it would, likely I think to be accepted. We'll talk about that. Yeah, before. we'll talk about that. Okay. I think it would be. It might be slower and harder to get there. But I think, yeah. We've been down that road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're well experienced, With, definitely. Yeah. Sure. So um, the, other, the other important metric when you're talking about dollars per square foot is it's per square, square foot of built construction. So if you have a 100,000 square foot school and another 100,000 square foot school and one of them needs to develop a parking lot and a playground and the other one needs a parking lot and a playground and six ball fields and a football field and maybe bleachers they're going to have the same square foot that you're dividing by but the site cost has increased dramatically and so it's going to be reflected in a higher dollars per square foot for the building even though they could be the exact same building put on the same site just one of them developed more of the site so you end up with more cost in there would there be a way to i think that's a great point and i'm just thinking ahead to help educate the community, would there be a good way to illustrate that, to break it down to that level, that if we look at just the square footage of this building compared to the square footage, site work off to the side, playgrounds, all of that, is that a possibility for comparisons? It's hard to get the detailed information that you need that's on a um, equivalent basis, because as I pointed out, every project ends up being a little bit different. And so, um, We've looked at a couple of metrics in terms of trying to compare things, but they become so nuanced that you lose a lot of that detail. Like even comparing to Marathon, it's difficult to make the comparison to Marathon because you have to talk about the escalation. Then you have to talk about we're building a building that's significantly less expensive to operate, and there's first costs that are going to be offset by future savings. Um, and just those two alone have big swings in what happens between the, the various costs. So that it, it becomes a, a difficult thing to really explain in detail in a way that's, that's understandable um, without really sitting and you know, working through all the details of it. And I think what you're, you're probably hearing from us and will continue to hear from us is we're probably just going to push that envelope all the way to November, right? Which is how much, how much information can we get that's relevant. So completely hear that but we also want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to message that so you know tell us when what we're asking for is impossible but we're probably going to keep asking for stuff <laughs> for the for the for this building for like the one building the estimate can be broken down that way so we can say x is going towards once the schematic estimate comes in we can say site and then steel and then all those different components but it is going to be virtually impossible to kind of really get a good feel basing it against another building because you don't know how their estimate was taken apart or how they were created. So it would be very difficult to do it, you know, apples to apples with another building that's not, that's estimated by someone else that's not this one. So on this slide, you can see that we took that trend line and we extended it to show that gradual curve that started to uptick. And what that is, is it's the effect of that compounding inflation. You're the, if you think of the, um, you know, go back to math class, if you think of the slope of that line is how much the change is over time, that change is tilting up as you get towards the end of it. And um, Marathon ends up clustered, or I'm um, sorry, Elmwood ends up clustered right in the middle of four other schools. And so just for um, comparison purposes, like we're talking about, we thought we would compare to those two schools. And so if you look at the next slide, um, the one of the schools is a vocational school. 
And so obviously a vocational school is gonna have technical needs that far outweigh what an elementary school is. And so that's the most expensive per square foot that was on there. So the other three that you see on there are um, Whitman Hanson Middle School, um, East Long Meadow High School, and Elmwood. And obviously the high school, as I said, is more expensive because of those extra needs that they have. They have a different number of students per classroom. They have different specialty classrooms that they need. And so really breaking this down to Whitman Hanson and Elmwood, you can see that Whitman Hanson does have a lower per square foot cost, but with only 675 students, they have a significantly higher per student served cost. And so it's an example of they don't have as much site work that they need to do. They're an existing site. They don't need swing space. They can build next to their school. And so all of that factors into how difficult it can be to just look at the chart and say, they're cheaper. Why can't we build like them? Right. So we also talked at the forum, um, got the question. I know the, it's come up in this committee before about what happens if we vote no. And so we wanted to summarize sort of some of the, the factors that that affects both from an MSBA perspective and also the factors that it affects from the school district perspective. And we'll have Dr. Kavanaugh speak to that in a minute. Um, from the MSBA perspective, they require after um, the board approval that you get your, uh, you basically have to get a yes vote from town meeting and from the voters um, for the project within, it's 120 days? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, if you don't get that that vote, then the project stops. It doesn't move forward. This committee would then disband. That's how the program works. Um, they'll typically want to understand, because they're a very data-driven group, the why of why it failed. What was the specific issue? We've seen towns where one very, very motivated voter has tried to stop the project and has basically been able to do it on his own. We've seen. Um, the general it costs too much and we can't afford this to go up at this time. So there's a range of reasons why it failed and so they want to understand that so that if you pursue it in the future they want to know that you have a plan to avoid it. You'll have to reapply to the program. There isn't a can you just put us on hold. The MSBA's goal is to get as many communities building schools as they can to refresh the school building population within the state and so they don't want to put another town on hold because one town isn't able to convince their voters to move it forward. And so they'll ask you to, to reapply. And as um, has been stated, the application process takes time. I think Elmwood was 2019 or 2020? It was March of 2020. So you can see just to get to this point took us three years. Um, and then you have the once re readmitted, they still have the same defined process. So you will need to hire a new OPM. You will need to reform your ESBC committee. You will need to go through a site selection process where you look at all available sites that are there at that time in the future. Then you need to narrow those down into the sites that you consider. And then you have to design a schematic design based on the site that you choose at that time. And it's not going to be good enough for the MSBA to say, we really like the work we did three years ago. Can we just keep that? They want you to go through the entire process again. They will not pay any reimbursement for that second feasibility study. They will say, we already gave you feasibility money when you did this the first time. And so you'll have to put the full bill until you get a passing vote for that school. So that initial money that they've already spent on the reimbursement is gone, and the town will have to cut, rather than, I forget exactly how much of the feasibility study, the MSBA. You know, the, the town has lived through this with the center, center school, where originally the Fruit Street project was voted down, and it took a similar uh, five years, I think, to get back into the program. And you guys paid the additional million dollars to go through the cycle all over again and go through the town meeting vote. So Correct. it is familiar to many of the taxpayers Back up to, like, maybe 
And if your vote passes the second time, at that point you're back in the program, you're back to getting reimbursed, and you're moving on to the building that you're going to build for your community. You're back to getting reimbursed for the construction cost. The feasibility is because never no, you reimbursed. Never, you it's you not never like get if you that. get past, they'll reimburse for the feasibility. Where that, you left off right. as a design mm -hmm. development yeah. forward. And, you know, as soon as this slide popped up, I had the thought, and Chris, you kind of said it, but I think this is one of those things that we'll want to say out loud as many times as possible between now and November. It's a, this is a double vote. This is a vote at town meeting, and this will be a vote at the ballot following, because we'll need to, this is obviously a debt exclusion given its size. So it will be, it requires both town meeting and the vote at the ballot. That's correct. And specific to this community, Elmwood is bursting at the seams. We know that we're ahead of projections. And so something will have to be done that will cost money to address that while you're in that three to five year period that um, the project is delayed. So we, we wanted to sort of throw this on a calendar slide for you. And you can see here, if we stay on the current path, we are looking at um, the design would start in basically November, December after a passing vote and would move forward so that we could break ground in the middle of 2025 with the goal that we would be occupying the school in the end of 2027. Should they vote no, your best case scenario for a new school would be to get back into the MSBA program in three years. And those three years would mean that by the time you're opening that school under the readmission to the program, would be in 2031 and we already know from the demographics that you will have swelled significantly in that period of time so that um, Elmwood will be very challenged and the time in between which is almost four years will need temporary solutions at Elmwood to deal with that overcrowding anyway there's the you're at the point that you're bursting at the seams now so expand that over a couple of years and that will have to be dealt with, and you'll still need a new school because we're talking about an end of life replacement. And let's be uh, let's, let's sort of be explicit about that, right? So again, just for purposes of making sure everybody really fully understands what we're talking about, you're talking about solutions. What you're talking about is temporary classrooms, right? We're, we're talking about additional physical space that we need to put these students. And so, if you roll in, when we think about rolling in costs, right, that is cost that's rolled into to a, a no vote and a project delay as well is that the the town would have to incur the cost of that temporary space to house these students because it is very much not a the we can hit pause on everything that's happening these kids are still in large measure here they're just not old enough to go to school yet and they and we're going to need some place to put them and that temporary those temporary measures have experienced the same inflation that right. um regular construction has experienced so modulars are more expensive than they were three years ago I would also add to that though that the two three four grade configuration is helping a problem that's upstream quite a bit and if this gets put off till 2031 I believe by then we're expecting 1500 kids at the high school is that 1500 kind of, we currently have about 1200 and, and we don't have space for those 300 so we would have to have something to address the high school middle school area as well if we aren't able to complete a 234 project now following up with John's comment a couple of minutes ago more information is better as much as we can get would you be able to provide specific approximate costs of what it would be for those additional modular classrooms and things if there was a no vote so they would have that information we could probably reach out to the estimators and figure out. And I'm not suggesting that's all that has to be done. Right. All that, whatever has to be done, I think it would be good to have a, a number, approximate number associated with it. And just instead of suggesting it's going to cost a lot, because someone will say, what does that mean? Right. Is it 20 million? Is it 10? Is it 50? Yeah. If, it's, if that's possible. The other, the other thing that, that I suspect people would be interested in is, is what does 170 million look like in three years? Say we built the same school three years from now. What is it now? You know, in, you know, the inflation ideally is probably not going to keep going like this. But even if you just modulate, it always increases. It never goes down. Mm -hmm. 
it would be nice to know what the number will be in three years, and and that might help people. I think most SMEs are feeling it, that we're normalizing now, that they've seen this big spike and we're going back down to a three to four percent. Yeah, like with what we had seen. Two to three to four percent over three years and one hundred seventy yes. million dollars is a, a couple of bucks. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, and and I, th I think that there's an important component to that conversation, too, which it, admittedly, I think, is the conversation we're starting to get engagement from with the town that yeah. we need to keep driving, which is that the, there is definitely a perception that this, again, currently estimated, <coughs> roughly estimated $170 million yeah. is an extravagance and that there lies somewhere a $110 million solution to this problem. I'm not gonna sit, just have you take our word for it, but please follow along in the process as we go through this. $170 million is what a school that is gonna house 1,195 elementary school students is gonna cost when we go to bid it out in a year, two years. So it, you, if you see something in these meetings and you say, aha, they were wrong. If we do this, we can shave all of this money off the project. Please, Please reach out to us directly. We would love to know what we missed. But we are doing, we are really taking a very diligent approach to trying to manage these costs. And again, the people who are on this committee are taxpayers too. Um, very few of us even have kids that are going to come close to going to this school. So it is, you know, we, we don't want this number to be any higher than it is. So um, we have a couple of slides here for Dr. Kavanaugh, who, who spoke last or uh, last Wednesday about some of some of the things we talked about, but some additional detail. Yes. So, so thank you, Chris. Um, one of the before I even address this slide, one of the things that we need to acknowledge is that right now the population at the Elmwood School and the population at the Hopkins School they are too great to be accommodated by the square footage in those two buildings. So regardless of you know how people are feeling about this you've got to realize that we are now cramming children into those buildings and the projections are that those numbers are only going up and if you had asked me this question two or three years ago I would say well I don't know let's see how it's tracking we are tracking ahead right now of where two different demographers said they would be one of whom is an MSBA demographer um, so just to start, Elmwood is an end-of-life so, replacement. Sorry, Dr. Kavanaugh, can I, because yeah. I think that this would be helpful for people to understand. I'm really glad you brought up that sort of where we are now. And you, you talk about the space constraints. Can, can you give us like 30 seconds on like what does that practically mean in terms of class sizes, lunches, gym, like those kinds sure. of things? Because I think when people hear they're cramming those kids in, I mean, our, our kids, and thanks to the faculty and staff uh, and administration, are getting a great education. But like, what? How does that actually play out as they think about what a future state would look like? Sure. So maybe a good example is the work that we have done at Hopkins School to accommodate the kids. We're at 650 students at Hopkins. Uh, so at the start of this school year, Mr. Person, Mrs. Rothermick, and I visited the Hopkins School, and we went to science lab and we dismantled that. And now that is a regular general education classroom. And then we went to a similar room, and these are interior classrooms, they don't have windows to the exterior, but in that, that similar room it was set up so that you had small group instruction in there. So there would be maybe ESOL instruction, reading remediation, all of those things happened in that room. We dismantled that to turn it into a general education classroom. So now you say, well, where are the children who need small group instruction going? And we're building these small spaces with kind of artificial walls in the back of the library media center so that we can educate kids there. Mrs. Bellello and Mr. Cotter have vacated their offices, and so now they are going to be moving into a what used to be a conference room and it will be a shared space for the principal and the vice principal just so that we have small instructional spaces. There's literally not another inch that we can take in that building so I really don't know what would happen. We've put four classrooms on as you know in the last five years. I really don't know where we would educate another classroom of kids um, and we're adding two fifth grades this year. So, Thank you, that's very helpful. Mm. Yeah. Carol, I would just mention lunch too. You know, I think our lunch schedules are, are a little bit jammed up. So. 
Yes, I mean, if you go to any of our buildings for recess time, I mean, maybe Mrs. Carver should speak to what recess looks like at the Elmwood School, but because you have so many classrooms and they need to get outside for recess, the space that they have for recess, especially at Elmwood, is you know certainly not enough for kids. So they're, they're taking recess in a driveway, they're taking it in a big open field, some of them are on the playground space. Uh, we have the driveway blocked off because deliveries are coming, so, you know, all day long, it's, it's just, it's a little chaotic, but we're making the best that we can in the space that we have, which is very limited. And as Mr. Person said, you know, we are running four lunches, and when the kids go into the lunch line at Elmwood, for example, you know, it's hard to offer them a lot of different lunch choices because if the lunches move too slowly and we now have four lunches and we're, we're lacking the time, we've just got to get those kids through the line and, and here's your lunch, my friend. So it's, it's challenging. Um, so right now we are about 635 at Elmwood and 650 at Hopkins. Um, when we take a look at grades two, three down the road, the second and third grade population is predicted to be at 775 students. That's 140 more than we have today. Uh, when we look at a two, three, four population, that's predicted to grow to 1,175. The estimated percent reimbursement on this project is 25%. And so if we just take that $170 million figure, and I know that we've repeatedly said at this table tonight, we do not know that $170 million is the price tag on this building. We won't know that until August. We're making all kinds of choices about design and facade and uh, removing different spaces inside the building. We're doing a lot of work to keep the, that cost down. But if we take 25% of that 170 million, we're talking about a $42.5 million reimbursement from the MSBA. Um, that's huge. And this school is slated to open somewhere around December of 2027. We know that our population is going to grow even between today and that time. What you see on the screen right now, and it's very difficult to see that, of course, is the MSBA's demogra demographer's predictions of our enrollment. And so I've just put the call-out box on there so that you can see that currently in grades 2, 3, we have 635, and it's projected that we'll go to 775, a difference of 140 kids for 2, 3 school. If we're talking a 2 th to 4 school, we currently have 976 students in those grades. It's projected to go to 1175, so we're talking about 200 kids. So when people keep saying you're going to be building this building and you don't even know if the kids are coming, we really are at just about 1,000 kids today, and we're building a school for 1175. So realistically, we're about 200 kids shy. Um, I, d I don't necessarily know that we are making an assumption that isn't a good one, given how far ahead we are already tracking. Uh, I think if, in a future slide you'll see that the anticipated number at the, for this year was about 626 and we're at 635 across the grade levels. And that was with the MSBA demographer whose predictions were higher than our own uh, privately hired demographer. Uh, so let's imagine that we do nothing with the Elmwood School and it remains a 2-3 school. If you are going to have 140 more students join that school, and we typically put about 23 kids in a classroom. They would be in need for six additional classrooms. Now, I know people are wondering, is 23 a big number or is it a small number? And so if you look at the average class size in Massachusetts, and this encompasses you know, classrooms of three kids, classrooms of 40 kids. You, know, you can have the band being averaged in there, and you can have small group reading being in averaged in there. But for the state, it's 17.2 kids, and in Hopkinton, it's 19.6 kids. So we're about two and a half kids higher than the state average. We really do not have a, a, a pretty generous class size um, here in Hopkinton. I think we're very fair with what we offer kids in terms of class size and teacher-student ratio. Uh, but as I've said, there are no additional available classrooms at the Elmwood School. So our cafeteria is too small. Our, our gym is okay in terms of sizing for the number of kids who are there. We would need special education classrooms. We would need ESOL classrooms. We are woefully behind at Elmwood in terms of outdoor space. And we should probably talk about what we would do in, if we need six additional classrooms. Sorry, I apologize for interrupting you again, but I'm on uh, abbreviation police tonight. So ESOL <laughs> is 
if I'm not so, and then this has changed, I think, three times since I was on school committee. It's, it's people may know that as either English language learner or or English as a second language. I don't know what it yes, stands for so now. Yes, so that's English for speakers of other languages okay. is what we call it now. Okay. Uh, when I came to Hopkinton, we had about 48 students who identified that way. Um, today we are at about 250. And then when you take a look at kids who have kind of placed out of the program because their English has become proficient, we still have to count them as fells, and so we still have to evaluate them okay. Okay. regularly. Yeah. Former English learners. Former. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't even catch that one. You're right. And the, other, and the other important number, Carol, is the staff to support all of that. Yes. You know, we, we're fortunate to be hiring three tutors for next year because of our needs. And, and we really are scrambling to find a place to put them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, teachers who are teaching, we hope that we'll be able to push in, meaning the, the support will go into classrooms and support kids. Um, that, that even, even having a teacher in the classroom, another adult, a desk or a spot where a, a teacher can support those kids. We, we don't have any room. So a lot of that is taking place in the hallways. But if you picture 600 and 50 students transitioning at any given time, when they're walking by those learning spaces, learning can't take place. Yes, and we already have, in, in many cases, 15 classrooms at a grade level. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a lot of classrooms, which I think is why we were very careful to design the building as it was designed so that kids are going to feel like they live in sort of a small school with six classrooms of second graders, six classrooms of third, and six classrooms of fourth. They'll live in a small school in a much larger school. Can I ask one more question? Let, let me take the other side of this just for a moment, that for whatever reason, it doesn't work out this way, and we don't have that many kids come. You know, Nancy brought up a point, you know, so it's not 1195, that might be 1100. Nancy brought up the point, we've got this upstream problem. Mm. We talked early in the process about swing space. If we did have a little extra room in this building, mm -hmm. could it possibly be used to alleviate some of the other problems we know we have coming? I think that it probably could. I mean, I, I would imagine that if you had classroom space there, uh, I mean, what would happen if you said, so we're moving six fifth grade classrooms into a two, three, four school? Um, but I mean, at this point, I think that that's kind of a guess, right? Mm. I mean, we, as you'll see in one of these future slides, you're going to see that it doesn't really matter um, which upstream school you're looking at, there is potential for enrollment difficulty. And Bill? But it potentially we, could be a backup, I guess is what I'm trying to it say. It gives us flexibility. Yeah, we flexibility. know from the system-wide study that that problem exists now. Right. We know that the, we're over capacity in a lot of the schools, and that's why the Hopkins project is moving forward. And we know from how the system-wide study was outlined that there's challenges at Marathon, and there's challenges at the high school. And the system-wide study gave us a roadmap of how we can address some of those, but if we get a year into Elmwood, those projects could still be going on, and I think Marathon's the last project that the school committee will be looking at on the schedule that was outlined, and we may know where Elmwood's at at that time, and we can do reevaluations yeah. when that design team's brought on board, and maybe there's a solution there, but it's, this isn't a, it's not a projected problem. It's a problem now. No, I understand that, but again, thinking in terms of the community who feels this school is built, it's too big, we don't need it. I think here at the table, because this is probably our 30th meeting in a year and a half, we know it's a current issue, but if something were to happen, some have suggested that you know, this talk of raising taxes to the level that we're considering having to do it may preclude some people that were going to move here and say, I can't afford it anymore. We may not have this extra push of children in the next five to eight years. I just, but at the same time, I don't believe we're overbuilding either. And I just wanted to bring that up in a conversation to, to show that we probably could still use this space even if we don't need every single square foot for the projections if they come in a little bit lighter. Yeah, you may not need every single square foot. I shouldn't say you may not. We think you will, but yeah. in the event that you didn't, for this particular set of grade levels, two, three, four, we have so many other space problems in this district. Right. To Nancy's point. And yes. centrality of location mm -hmm. it also gives that flexibility of whether it could be a little bit more creative. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Thanks. 
All right, I know this has been said tonight. If there's a no vote, it's special town meeting in November. The project with the MSBA uh, stops and Hoppington exits the program. I won't belabor that point. Um, if there is a no vote at special town meeting in November, we lose our MSBA reimbursement um, if we were to you know, try to do this project on our own, uh, of course. Uh, and that MSBA re reimbursement is you know, plus or minus $44 million, the way we have things calculated now. All right, and if there is a no vote at special town meeting in November, uh, we can submit another statement of interest to the MSBA, which we did, as we said, as far long ago as March of 2020. Um, but there really is no guarantee of, of acceptance. I mean, we have submitted SOIs to the MSBA for the Elmwood School from 2007, not every single year, but many years, until it was finally accepted in 2020. All right, so what would we do uh, with the Elmwood School in terms of our space challenges? If we did need those six classes, uh, one of the things you can do is you can increase class size. So instead of having 23 students in a classroom, you could go up to having 26 <coughs> students in a classroom, and that would help you to maybe not need six, but rather need five. Um, as we talked about, bringing modular classrooms, the trailers on site, and you know we know that that comes with a cost, and that cost is also experience the same inflation as, as other projects in the construction industry. Uh, we could create classrooms in part of the gymnasium, so with you know kind of artificial walls, you could set up a couple of classrooms there. Um, but we are going to need classrooms, There's, there is no question. Um, that would take the Elmwood Gymnasium offline for community use because you can't set up a classroom and dismantle it with any regularity, I and mean, once it's set up, it's set up. Uh, we would have four lunches and they would still have more students or we may need to move to five lunches. The fear in moving to five lunches is the kids are kind of getting off the bus and eating lunch and then they're eating lunch and getting back on the bus um, depending upon where your, your one of five lunch fall, well, lunches fall. And we really would have to reduce the meal options down to you know maybe one or, one or two things because we've got to get the kids through those lines. Um, having gym classes scheduled for 36 classrooms would require the school to uh, probably create some very large class sections, and I know that Mrs. Carver can talk to that now, but when you go into the, the gym, sometimes there are two classes, having a gym class at the same time, it's fine, it works out. Um, that would be the sort of thing that we would need to continue to do um, moving forward, probably with more frequency than we do it now. Uh, other related arts class would also have class size problems, and um, I think once we get past like 30, you probably would need to bring in another art teacher anyway. So we would need to hire another person at like point two uh, to come in there and then find space for that person, because you can't have two art teacher teachers or you can't have two music teachers kind of going concurrently. They just wouldn't fit in the classroom. Uh, our special education classes, we would need to find space for them. Very often what happens is you take a gen ed classroom and you empty it and you create four small groups in one, that, one space. Um, I would like to suggest that we could use some of the smaller spaces at Elmwood, but I'm telling that they are all, they are all full. Um, and then of course traffic would increase on Elm Street and Wood Street and that would probably require us to have more buses because we wouldn't be getting the guaranteed kind of one-stop shopping that we would have if everyone were on Hayden Rose Street. Um, so with increased ridership in the buses you would need obviously more buses to go to that other part of town. All right, and then the last part is that we need to think about how this Elmwood project is connected to the district master plan. We keep talking about upstream. What does it look like? How does this fit into the formula to alleviate some of the stress as we look at what will happen at Hopkins in the middle school and the high school? So I did, did just want to. I did just want to add one point. Um, we brought up in the forum last week it, as we were talking about the decisions that the ESBC has made in terms of um, trying to reduce costs. And one of them that I think doesn't doesn't sell as well the way that it was described is that we took a thousand square feet out of the program so far. And a thousand square feet in when you're talking about 176 million seems like a small number. But that's a thousand square feet in a building that's seven hundred and sixty-seven dollars a square foot. So you're talking about a seven hundred to seven hundred and sixty thousand dollar reduction from just that one step. And so that's a that's then multiplied by the soft costs that are associated with that. And so you could be looking at eight hundred and fifty to nine hundred thousand that's coming out just from that one decision. 
No, that's, that's important clarification. Um, one thing I do also want to just note, because I've gotten this question a couple of times since the forum, and I think uh, um, in an effort to sort of simplify the reimbursement question for people, I think we might have actually complicated it. Um, so it, it, I, there was reference, I think, Dr. Kavanaugh, in your slide, the number I've been using all the time, too, is 25%. And so people will come back and say, well, such and such a town is getting 40 something percent. Mm -hmm. Hopkinton's reimbursement rate with the MSBA is 42, 42, 42 ish percent, right? When we say 25 percent, it's because not everything is reimbursable. So the estimate is that all in, if you take the total cost of the project and you apply that 42 ish percent to all of the reimbursable costs, what will end up getting back? is 25% of the overall project cost. So it's not that if it's not that Hopkinton's reimbursement rate is 25%, it's that the amount of actual dollars we will get back will account will equate to something in the neighborhood of 25% of the project cost. And so that's just a question I've gotten a number of times and I realized that I think I and we kind of might have created that confusion in trying to simplify it for people. So the effective reimbursement the effective reimbursement rate, right? And it's worth saying that that's every district has yeah. exactly the same, yeah. Yeah. not the same percentages, but the same type of yeah. um, actual versus effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it can be more at the end because you're, when you're presenting it at town meeting, it's based on is if you spend every dollar in your bucket, all the contingencies, all the, all the items and the actual line items, at the end of the project, you get your reimbursement first, and then you cap out. But if you don't spend those extra contingencies, the, the effective rate actually bumps up. Yep. So it's a projection, the 25% of the projected effective reimbursement rate. How has that number trended versus time? Has that number gone up or stayed pretty flat? It's it's complicated. An hour ago. So. <laughs> um, uh, this, oh, I'll let Jeff take so, it. Um, Towns, the town gets their original reimbursement rate, which is your effective 42%. And I'll cover this all this summer in more detail with slides, but you start at 42 based on your socioeconomic demographics, and you get a couple of percentage points for how well Tim maintains your buildings, and then you get two more for your uh, sustainability. So you get up to 4% more on top of that. You cap out with the dollars per square foot of construction, which you heard earlier tonight does not keep pace with the actual construction costs that are out there today. They cap out designer consultant fees, OPM consultant fees. They cap out your contingency. So there's all these other things that get, get re, uh, redistributed. Every three years or so, they change it. And they, they go up with the construction number, but they've gone down with the OPM and the designer. So you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Always it goes up a little, but it's, it's a moving metric. They play around with the different formulas. So at the end, the town gets more, but it's not a clear jump. You have to kind of run it through the calculator. So, a town that has no site work does a little better because all that stuff is not getting hit with the site cap. They're only getting hit with the building cap. So it's, it varies from town to town and it varies from project to project. There are some of the tax credits that we get, for example, for geothermal under the IRA and that got amended in October 22. Are there expiration dates for some of those tax credits? Um, well, I can only say that, that the IRA specifically is a 10-year yeah. window, um, but it also is a certain uh, number of billions of dollars that it's first come, first serve, and we would be at the front of the line. Mass save is a much longer history and track record, though that money is there. We all pay it in our electric bill. Um, the IRA is more um, on a need basis as it rolls out by the government as they re it. And the reason for that question is we've, we've been talking about the consequences of a no vote, which would be a delay of two to three years, and does that take us to the limit of these tax credits? Who knows what it could be, how, how that delay could impact some of the benefits we are getting today. That's a good point. Possible. Quite possible. Yeah. Okay, so should we transition to faculty focus group? I think so. Um, Which again, an important sort of thinking about community engagement, a question we got a couple of times at the forum was about how we're engaging 
faculty, staff, and administration in this process. So I think this is yeah. a great time to talk about this. And so this is something that will continue. It's iterative. Um, should the vote pass, if we continue, we'll be back many more times every phase um, to refine and get more information. So I first put up here what you've already seen before, which is the faculty focus groups that we had back in April. And that was kind of a, uh, a first meet and greet at that level to really talk about um, space needs. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the 12 plus categories that are in the MSBA space template. We met with those groups and more. And you can see here, we just had some highlights, uh, understanding um, the spaces that we have, but also their location, how they're really needed to be positioned to work effectively. Um, so we collected information on that. In some cases, understanding that, for example, ESOL, um, is going to work and perform better if the rooms are doubled up back to back with a communicating door in between. That also builds more flexibility for the future because that's a classroom size space. We, we heard about the potential for conversion, uh, whether it's a classroom into two ESOL or ESOL into a, a classroom. Um, it's ideal for flexibility. It works better for that program. So we heard of a number of things. We also heard um, the need for a little bit more space. Um, we had uh, rounds of meetings to kind of uncover and determine what we needed, a refinement on math or reading specialists. So there was a, a little bit of tweaking to the educational program. And then going forward to this next round of meetings, um, we can see the same subject matter. We met with everyone again. This time we came with actual room layouts with front, a first pass at furniture, marker boards, built-in cabinetry. So uh, the purpose was to get a little finer look at the workings within the room and what you need um, rather than what you want. And um, so we, we kind of refined what goes into the rooms as well. Um, and that's important too, because as we build towards the scope of the project, right now we have allowances for all these things. So this will allow us to have a sharper pencil. Um, this isn't everything, but you can see from the highlights, there's a, there's a little bit less. We're getting closer and closer. I think there were only maybe uh, one, uh, one maybe program question about needing an additional space, but a lot of it, again, was just, just getting into the details, maybe a, a, a few questions about the locations or how speech rooms work. Um, it was focused really on the desks, the tables, the chairs, um, where and how we're going to store and, and charge Chromebooks, so really just diving into a little bit uh, deeper. And some of the things that we discussed um, when I participated with Bob was, were the solutions that we were looking at the right fit for the space? Are we providing too much? Are we providing too little? Or are we providing things in an, in an inefficient manner that we could do better? We looked at how we could subdivide some of the um, third classroom spaces in a more efficient manner so that they would offer more flexibility or so that they wouldn't have as much corridor space within a sub like a subdivided suite. And so looking at ways that we can deliver an efficient building at the end of the day without going with a more costly solution. Any questions? Any questions on that? No? Just appreciate the update and the continued engagement. OK. Landscape and site plan update. So the last time we met, I think we had some great feedback on how we could look at the site plan and pieces that we could start to refine. So we really spent the last couple weeks looking at how we can keep the critical site program elements like circulation, outdoor education, all those things we need, but at the same time refine the plan, bring in it a little bit, look at how we can call back some of these spaces and um, you know, overall reduce the amount of the site, site work. So some of the big things we've been focusing on are primarily looking at the field space. How much field space do we really, really need? So one of the big pieces is we have looked at the PE fields and reduced those um, from 260 by 400 to 210 by 330. And this would maybe seem like a small improvement. It's still able to be broken up into four spaces. It's still a soccer field size. But what that's allowed us to do is tighten up that entrance road from Marathon We've been able to move the overflow parking adjacent to it and really start to limit the disturbance in the area. Another piece that we've done is taken the ring road and we jump to an enlargement and pulled that even closer to the rear of the building. 
So we still have space for the addition, but we have brought it in significantly. Um, and when you look at the overall disturbance, you know, that also brings the playgrounds in with it. We've reduced from 18 acres of disturbance to 15, which is a pretty substantial change, and I think overall better in terms of maintaining vegetation as well. So with some of the other big pieces, um, entrance plaza. Again, we still need to make sure we have enough safe space for students to unload off our bus or get on a bus, but we've looked at calling that space down, reducing it, and minimizing the widths of those walkways. Um, we've also looked at taking the outdoor classrooms and minimizing the amount. So whereas we had started at, I think, five, then we went down to four, now we're looking at three outdoor classrooms, each one size to accommodate one uh, class of students. Um, and then I think another really great improvement is some of the recess spaces. So again, a field space there was initially designed, I think, by 200 by 260, which could be broken into two smaller field spaces. We've looked at bringing that back. It's the size of a U10 field space, just to give you a point of reference. So it's a still decent sized space, but again, it's just allowed us to constrict the site plan slightly. We've also, um, we know we wanted two basketball hoop areas. So we've kept one full court, but where there's a court where maybe we wanted lower hoops, can we make this a half court and actually have more functional, exciting hoops that are more to the scale of the actual users? And this has helped to bring in that size too. So overall, we still have a great recess area, but it's really substantially been uh, reduced and brought closer to the building, and that's helping um, overall in terms of the site layout. So we've even reduced, we talked about overall acreage, but looking at the paving of the site, which is a really big number, and we've taken that down by a half acre too of just actual hardscape, which is a very substantial improvement. Is there any questions on that? I do, uh, and I've had this for a couple of meetings now, so thanks for coming back. Um, and I must just be missing it. I'm looking at them both screens. It went from five to four to three outdoor learning, mm -hmm. but I only see two on the, the charts. You know, uh, so you know, in between the top. Uh, two on the charts. Yeah, two of the outdoor learning tabs, if you will. I'm so. The next couple of slides. You know? Oh yeah, the actually, slides. there we go. Look at this. I have a I have a blow up for you. Okay. <laughs> the so. outdoor classrooms are actually located in red in those little bubbles. So this upper courtyard, you have two outdoor classrooms. One here. Okay, this there's two and one. Two They're kind of one. overlapping. Exactly, there, and yeah. then you have another breakout space here. Okay. okay. And then in the lower courtyard, where this is going to be our main access to play, so we're really focused on that pathway transition. You have one. Um, outdoor classroom right towards the end of that as well and that leads you directly out to the playground did that answer that question I know it's hard to see sometimes when it's so small and on that top outdoor classroom mm -hmm. could two classrooms access it at the same time you could potentially do that yes yeah we could build in seating so that you could accommodate two classrooms and, and the outdoor classrooms don't have to be hugely elaborate I think one of the biggest things we heard is there's a need for outdoor seating and flexible tables that you can actually work outside of. That, that's a great point, and I'm wondering, in the explanation that we'd share with the community, could you give us three bullet points? What is an outdoor classroom? Because it, it kind of leaves it to the imagination of what it might be. So that would be helpful. Maybe it's four bullet points, but uh, to help educate everyone, right. that would be great. So some of these outdoor classrooms specifically, and we can do that in greater detail, um, maybe it's just a space for a teacher to be outside with their students in the landscape outside breathing fresh air where specifically this upper area where you have seating for the teacher and then bench seating behind and that can be it. Um, the lower garden is maybe a pergola so it's a shade which is super important for students when they're outside and maybe that's surrounded by outdoor vegetable gardens. Now vegetable gardens is something that you already have at the school today. So replicating that program, but improving it and making it a lot more functional. And then maybe this other space is a combination of seating in green spaces. There can be sensory learning out there in terms of after musical instruments, or maybe it's just a place for students to take a notepad, paper, and draw and look at the landscape around them. Yeah, another thing that you could say about it is there are outdoor learning spaces now that are mm -hmm. used, like Little Fenway. Right. Um, these would be handicapped accessible, which is a, yeah. a, a good improvement. And where we don't have the large pine trees to offer shade, um, the shade is provided. 
Yeah, I think, Bob, I, I think even referencing the, the spaces at the existing Elmwood that are, that are in use, like, I, I think that's something that, that is important for the community to understand when we talk about outdoor classrooms. This is not some newfangled idea that we're coming up with. It, <laughs> teachers are taking the students outside when the weather's nice now because it yes. gives them great opportunities to both just get a little bit more sun but also further the educational model. And what we're talking about here is just in some cases, relatively small landscaping yeah. improvements to just give them a defined space to do that. Um, you know, I, I mean, outdoor sort of outdoor learning dates back to as far back as when we were in school, right? The teacher would take you to have class outside, but you just sit on the lawn. This gives them a little bit more flexibility and accessibility. And during the pandemic, I think teachers really appreciated being outside. Yeah. So where we may have started to sort of trend away from taking kids outdoors to learn. Throughout the pandemic, teachers started to say, we just want to be outside where the air is fresh. And having the opportunity to transition outdoors, to have a new environment, maybe the teacher is using that classroom space just to read. You know, maybe bring a book and share a, a reading or some writing with students. Um, and the movement to get there, to, to relocate, um, holds kids' attention at this age. And then the movement back into their um, classroom spaces is, is really appreciated for kids, and um, it, there's a, a huge push right now at Elmwood to have places outside. And if you drive by Elmwood on any day, this week, last week, next week, teachers are fighting for our one spot um, to conduct. Parents who are watching, maybe they're nodding their heads and saying, I went to a beautiful tea there yet. We call mm -hmm. it tea. They're not serving tea, but um, they're, they're sharing um, an opportunity to wrap up the year with a little celebration and families are coming with blankets and chairs and um, it's just a nice opportunity to learn while you're outside but it's there's nothing new to it but I think it can be easy to lose sight of the quantity of kids that we're talking about for each of these sessions if you have a 1200 student um, population in that building and you have six recesses each one of those recesses is 200 kids looking for something to do and the proximity of these outdoor classrooms, they might be seating, they might be tables, like writing surfaces so they can color and draw when they're at recess. And it's hard to find enough stuff for 200, to kid, 200 kids to do for six recesses. You're probably gonna want fewer than that in the new school, so that just increases the number of kids that we're potentially looking at that need something to do when they're doing that run around time. Not every kid wants to run around in a field or play basketball. Sometimes they just want to sit at a table and draw. And that's one of the things that both the Hopkins and the Elmwood teacher shared with us when we met with them and talked about recess. And you actually just keyed me up perfectly for this next slide, but 200 students outside at one time in recess is a lot of yeah, students. Yeah. So, you know, that is something that we need to accommodate. And when you look at the overall square footage of this, it's roughly 50,000 square feet with the fields, hardscape, yeah. and the playgrounds. Of that, the actual playgrounds is only 11,000 square feet, which is approximately 5,500 square feet um, per, we'll call it structured play with play surfacing. So that is not, I think it's a substantial space. It's, it can accommodate that amount of students, um, but it's not overkill. It's not above and beyond. And what's actually interesting, when we originally started some of these visioning studies looking at different sites, um, we have stats based on past projects and case studies we've done of like sizes of play areas that are sufficient. And this is tracking right in line with what we thought was the median of that, which is about 250 square feet per student. But again, only 11,000 of that is actual structured play and you have hardcore and uh, field as well. <coughs> I, I just want to comment that I want to thank you for doing this. Um, that was my major concern last time, that it seemed like it was a little bit too much. And I can see how you pulled everything in, and we still provide for the kids, which is the important thing. I want to thank you for that. Oh. Yeah, no, it's great. And I actually think pulling it in is better because, you know, even by reducing the field, pulling in the rig road, we're getting everyone closer to the school, too, yeah. because it is far away. Just we know we have a lot of circulation to the site to accommodate. so pulling everything closer is easier and more manageable. 
we're also within 5,000 square feet of not filing for MEPA. Right. <laughs> oh, we're we're tracking in the right direction. 5,000 above it or below it at this point? We're above it, but we're, we're confident we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. Thank you. We're getting there. You're welcome. But again, thank you for all your work. It's great. I have a question sure. before we move on. <clears throat> so again, I appreciate the, the, the cost reduction, essentially, uh, taking it down from five outdoor classrooms to three. My question is, if three outdoor classrooms meets the educational plan, what was the rationale, rationale behind starting with five? And what I'm really trying to understand is you know, we are achieving cost reduction. It's, it's a tighter site, which is great. But what are we giving up mm -hmm. by going from five to three? Well, and I'll let you fill in as well. But I mean, initially, when we look at this, we look at program based on kind of this wish list of all the different classrooms and everything we can have. So I think we look at field sizes, and we start with that ultimate, what is the best? But then we really start to call it back and say, what do we actually need? So I think initially saying maybe five or two per courtyard would be realistic. But I think on further discussion, there really aren't any outdoor classrooms now. At Elmwood, so this is a significant improvement of having these three at all to be used, and having some of them that are a little bit more flexible that can accommodate maybe two classes is even better. And I think you always have to go back to we're talking about 54 classrooms worth of students at the building, so you start to break that down in terms of what that means for the seasons when you're going to use that, and how much does that actually mean about how often each class would get to use that space. Right. You only have, I think, six periods a day. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to divide those six periods a day, five days a week, across all 54. Uh, you're not going to get out there three, four times a fall yeah. uh, per classroom. And so the more you provide, the more opportunities those students have, just given the volume of kids that are in the building. I think you. You can't talk about costs or the decisions we're making about this building without talking about the volume of users it's going to serve. Because it's easy to say 1,200 is not that many, but any parent who's hosted a birthday party, <laughs> like, uh, my son brings 20 friends over, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> How a teacher is going to supervise that many kids, like, that's what they do every day. And so we want to give them the resources to be able to do that effectively in Hopkinton. So in, this, in the case of the outdoor classrooms, it means fewer classrooms will be able to access an, that outdoor space on any given day. But it's still, it's still sufficient. It's probably the right number is what you're saying. I, I don't know if we know what the right number is. I, you know, I think when we think about what things cost and, and what the essentials are, I think we're trying to find a balance between, as we said, what do we actually really need and, and what would really enhance learning for our students? And we're trying to find a place, some place right in the middle, right. Um, and I'm sure if we had more space, kids would use it, teachers would appreciate it. But what's the, what's the sort of minimum that we can um, feel good about providing for stu students and, and teachers, I think? Other questions on that? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Plan updates and exterior materials. materials. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the plan is is really, uh, as I had talked about, the plan is getting populated now with furniture, and we're we're kind of looking at placement of doors and everything. So it's getting into a little bit more detail. Um, I believe last time I was here we talked about probably the last plan changes that occurred which was uh, the cafeteria actually tightened up and is using a little bit more white space um, the stage rotated so it's on the exterior wall it will have glass behind it um, and uh, so it's basically gotten a little bit more efficient um, I think I also talked about with that efficiency, we saved a little bit more square footage, but then we found that we needed to spend a little bit on the stairwells at the end of each wing to make sure that they were really, um, they could remain a stairwell, no work necessary if you had to add classrooms onto the end of the wing. So we had to increase the landings a little bit to make that a reality. Um, so it was a trade-off in square footage, really. 
no other changes in the plan. Um, I think overall going through with the faculty, uh, through the focus groups, um, there's a pretty high comfort level about where everything is, how it's working, um, so that's good news. On the exterior design, um, the overall design is, is similar. We were talking about the exterior materials. Well, can I interrupt just for yeah, one absolutely. moment? Absolutely. Going back to the slide and just had, at one point, maybe I mis misunderstood, was the potential for the stage or the cafeteria to open to the outside? Was that a conversation we had, and is that no longer an option because of the way you reconfigured it? Um, there's a little bit of room outside. We're not focused on developing that. That could have some potential, something that we could study. It further. was the stage, wasn't it? Not the cafeteria. It was the stage, okay. yeah. The idea was, um, if we've done this on some projects where you position the stage so it, it serves interior but has the opportunity to open as a back wall and become part of an outdoor uh, space okay. for small performances or gatherings. Um, this would require a little bit of work to make that happen. There's not a lot of room, but it's a possibility. Okay, I'm kind of looking the other way, kind of his point. It seems like another thing we've kind of said, now nah, that would be nice to have, but let's focus more on getting this as tight as we can. Mm. So it's still an option, but it doesn't seem like it's, it's a, a need at this point. It's more of a, a wish. Yeah, it's, and design. it's also only one, it's only one of many ways to handle what might be an outdoor okay. space because we have a natural grade change here that can be used at low cost, you know, where we're sloping from one end of the north end of the site down to the south. A total of 12 feet, we'll be doing some cut and fill to balance that out, but um, there is still the ability to take advantage of the natural grade change and do something like a natural lawn amphitheater type of space. And the cafeteria is still one of the spaces that you're massaging as we've... Yeah, it seems to be the one space that keeps getting a little bit of a, a tweak and, and I guess I'd also say that this is schematic design. Should this pass the vote, this is really we're holding ourselves down to an efficiency, mm -hmm. to everything working, to the program. It doesn't mean that the design has to stop. It can always refine, get better, get even more efficient mm -hmm. if we have those opportunities, but also, you know, seek out opportunities. So on the exterior, um, the look hasn't changed. That seems to be relatively settled, but the materials have. We certainly heard the public uh, and the concerns overall about costs. We know that we've had lots of conversations here, not only about costs, but um, durability, maintenance. Um, so maybe I listened to exactly, but um, rather than come back with options or trot out some of what we looked at before, it seemed pretty clear where we were headed um, so we're back tonight to show you the, uh, a full masonry building. Um, we have taken the third story that you see in the front, which also becomes the majority of the classroom, three-story wings in the back, and are using a more economical um, CMU uh, concrete masonry unit, which mm -hmm. is similar to what you see, uh, what you see actually at the Marathon School. The intent would still be a light material, so it has those properties of kind of fading, feeling lighter, and also uh, helping to um, bounce daylight a little bit into the courtyards. Um, but that's a, that's a large portion of the building and that, that represents a savings. We also discussed here that um, be, given the size of this building that we still had to be cognizant of scale, approachability, the age group. Um, so the, the front of the building is brick. The base where we were um, previously introducing maybe a little bit of stone we think we can just do with an alternative version of brick so we can keep those costs down. And there's just a little bit of um, high density laminate, that's HDL panel, used very effectively to save costs but also add a little bit of a wood look. The idea is that where you have a, a run of windows, you're not putting masonry and carrying sure. steel for just that little bit of masonry, that, that you're using a material that's more in line with the window system itself. So I think in the end, We've got a building that will be, um, it'll have familiar materials, it'll have scale, it'll have maintenance durability. This has dropped about five, in the estimated cost, about 500,000 um, less than the, the, the less expensive uh, option that we showed last time. So this would be the most cost effective, durable, um, probably uh, appropriate range. 
And how would that affect the 170 number we keep talking about? What was the allowance in that 170? Is this less than that? It's less than that. Yeah. And how much less? <laughs> it's it's, Ballpark. it's a, it's a seven-figure number or less. So it's in the millions. Hmm. Millions. Probably between one and two. Okay. So we can add that to the list. Don't go. Yeah, right. You know, say that as we go from a PSR estimate, it's a concept drawing on a cartoon, and this one will have more edges and returns. So you'll see a lot more takeoffs. So I want to be, you know, it's important to count all the savings, but you know, don't hold the designers to the dollar amount individually because there's lots of actual design intent on this estimate versus the conceptual one that was based on a size of building, not a drawing. Of yeah, I think the important takeaway is we're using the most inexpensive materials that will last the longest. Correct. Yeah. And we have a Class A architect It's going to be a good looking building. Yeah. And that's all that matters from my perspective. And uh, you did exactly what we asked, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, and to Jeff's point too, the, the costs that we extrapolated here are really relative. That was to help make decisions to yeah. feel the magnitude. And so we've done the same with the interior. Um, are there any other questions on the exterior? And I'll move. Any other questions? Are there any sustainability aspects to the materials? Like one is better than the other? Um, a lot of it depends on how locally sourced some of the materials can be, but um, brick and, and the CMU, my understanding, is a pretty sustainable material. Some of the other materials that we've shown, um, they have different qualities. Um, you know, some of them not as environmentally friendly, but they'll last longer and, uh, and maybe the, you know, the uh, travel or, or distribution to get here isn't as great. Um, but uh, we've been working with our sustainability team on you know the range of products and, and wanting to make sure we steer clear of, of any any uh, sort of environmentally concerns or any that are really on the radar screen as not being sustainable choices. Okay. So you've already screened those options out. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, I would just echo what Mike said. I mean, it's a still, I know these are drawings, but it's still really maintained a, a nice, uh, warm, attractive look for the building with the less expensive materials. I think my fear was always the more inexpensive we get, the more institutional it looks, but you've done a really nice job, I think, of balancing that. So yep. thank you for responding to, this is sort of the theme of the meeting, right? Thank you for responding to our, <laughs> the concerns we expressed. Um, I think it looks great. So, do we need a vote? You don't have to vote. I mean, okay. It's just consensus. I mean, essentially, you know, we put a vote on there just in case it was a more heated debate, right? And we need to, to narrow to a focus. But I'm hearing general consensus. That's yeah. all we need. Yeah, and I, generally speaking, would prefer like yeah, I like to minimize the number of votes we have to take because yeah. they're harder to undo, right? If we have to change something. So, it, is that general consensus of the voting members of the committee feel like we're good to go? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Moving right inside to interior materials. Sure. So the interior is um, in some ways a little bit trickier because we don't have, um, it's not easy for us, for example, to take off the amount of uh, wallboard inside of the school. It's not as easy as, as just grabbing the linear foot. There's, there's a lot of considerations. It's That material is used for more than just walls. It's used for some soffits. So uh, without a full detailed cost estimate takeoff and, and assumptions built in. What we did try to do off to the left-hand side is is capture certainly floor and ceiling, that's simple plan area. Mm -hmm. So we're able to capture different parts of the building, the main entry, the vestibules, office areas, classrooms in total, um, the media center itself, the gymnasium. So this allowed us to really break down and, and isolate and say, okay, well, what are the appropriate materials for all these different areas? We did try to do a, uh, a rough guess on another important material choice, which is the wainscot. So as you go through a school, a modern school is actually built, the majority of the interior is with uh, durable drywall, usually a double layer of drywall, um, and then a protective surface on top. And there are reasons for that. Um, you know, a school um, from a different decade, century, may have been built with interior masonry walls, not as flexible and adaptable long-term uh, structurally uh, is is a lot more weight 
Um, getting services and electrical and data in the walls is not, it's not really conducive, um, and as well as uh, wireless and other things. So exterior envelope requirements also uh, really require increased insulation, so uh, you don't really see the solid masonry inside out. You really need that room for, for insulation. So uh, drywall is, is definitely a substantial part of it, and so the wainscope becomes critical to protect that. So I'm going to take us through, um, kind of in waves, just kind of four waves, of starting with up high, looking at ceilings. Um, the uh, high-performing acoustic ceiling tile, it's also called ACT. It's what you see in schools, but Tim, it's not the stuff that you've got that sags. Um, it's actually the requirements, uh, acoustic requirements alone, never mind light reflectance. Um, and the durability over time so it doesn't sag, uh, moisture resistant. Those things are kind of built in. The, the materials have come a long way. Um, it's used for, you know, 90 something percent of the school. Um, you can dial up and down the type of, the, the, the level of performance, but there's really not much of a dollar difference. And then it becomes a headache to, to know what tile is in what location. So, so we tend, and we also have school environments now that aren't just teaching in the classroom in the hallway is something else as you can see in this school you know we've got breakout rooms so teaching and learning happens most everywhere so we carry pretty much the the same high performance tile throughout the majority of the school again it's a very cost effective material um, drywall ceilings are more expensive that's what's also called soffits yeah. they require studs they require you know overhead drywall we avoid them as much as possible it used to be that you would always build a soffit when you had a transition of ceiling heights. Manufacturers have come a long way so that you can actually have just the acoustic ceiling tile and they make a panel that fits into their grid that create, you know, goes to those transitions. Uh, you, you don't have the access to the stuff above the ceiling that you would when you, the other tiles either. The, yeah. So the, it's, the tiles like we did at, at Marathon, you know, if they want to put more lights, less lights, change the lights, put a camera, it's just more panels. Whereas if you do a, a drywall sale like you have in your house, it's a major undertaking. And you can't see what you have up there. Right. And another reason to, to avoid them. So we try to keep them to an absolute minimum. There are places where you will want drywall, a vestibule, for example, where there's a lot of moisture, where there's a temperature differential from inside to out. You'll see drywall uh, typically with, uh, with like an epoxy paint. Also, also in, in, in bathrooms, Secure. you'll see it. Yeah. Um, for durability and then there are access panels but uh, really we try to use it sparingly overhead painted structure isn't something you can use throughout and and of course this is very low cost you're talking about paint but it's it's kind of deceiving because you can't just have your typical structure painted it requires acoustic treatment uh, or and or acoustic deck which is metal deck like this only perforated so it yeah. helps with the sound absorption so it's not just the paint, so that's that's a little tricky, but um, it certainly is cost effective in large format spaces like the gymnasium. Again, um, a modern or, or current gymnasium will be built with uh, acoustic panels and block built into the walls, built into the overhead so that um, it's actually a functional space. You're gonna have a gym with four classes going on at one time. So I'm getting on a tangent, but... Um, but painted structure is, is probably the right choice there. Yep. And then um, there's also the ability to use something that does cost more, an acoustic wood ceiling. I think we saw this in images at the Zervis Elementary School, the cafeteria, if you remember the kind of uh, swooped ceiling. Um, that was uh, a space that was dressed up slightly. It's a performance space. It was the one space in the school you know, that got, got kind of that, that look. Um, it's not real wood. It's a it's a, a metal wood with perforated uh, perforated metal with some felt behind it, so it's actually performs pretty well. Um, this is something you'll see w that we would suggest, in, not even in the full cafeteria, but maybe in portions of the cafeteria. Um, so this goes. Uh, how does this go? Did I pass something? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I skipped a slide. Yeah, yeah. So um, the next slide here tells us part of what I've said, where we're using these materials. So 90% of, of, of pretty much all the classrooms, 90% of the corridors and stairs, the media center, offices and suites, that's where the acoustic ceiling tile would go. That's the majority of your building. 
for now, we're carrying about 10% of all those areas as the painted drywall. Um, 10, sorry, 10% of corridors. We're carrying it in the vestibules and we're carrying it in the restrooms. That 10%, we'd still like to get down to like zero or five. Um, there's things we don't know. You, you know, we'll have expansion joints. We'll have um, in a building where you know it may be conducive to have drywall, so you can have an actual flexible joint between the hard surfaces. But um, for now, we're we're carrying 10% just to be conservative. Um, the painted structure in the gym, overhead at the stage, and of course in mechanical, electrical, and IT spaces, and the acoustic wood look. We're we're saying maybe in a portion of the of the cafe and, and maybe the main vestibule or entry area is a, is a possibility um, just to give a warm look when you come in. Um, when you see here, we take the dollar per square foot, we multiply it by the approximate square footage we're talking about, and then you can see the total co cost. So you can see, you know, the majority is the acoustic ceiling tile, um, some in the drywall, the acoustic wood ceiling. This is maybe something we want to talk about, but that would be um, 180,000 of the total cost of the ceilings. So for an order of magnitude, that's a suggestion. Um, we can take, uh, I can stop in each surface or I can get through floors, walls, ceilings. You want to talk about the acoustic wood ceiling? It just seems $180,000 an extravagant amount of money to make the ceiling look pretty when we could do it with paint or anything else. That's why they make architects. It just, you know, and we're trying to keep the budget as, as yeah. low as possible. If I'm sitting in the audience and the taxpayer voting on this thing, I said, $180,000 to make the ceiling look pretty with wood that's not really wood? There's got to be something else we can do, Bob. I, I, just my perspective. It, the other architect, I know it'll look pretty. That's not the question. It just seems to be an extravagance given the fact that the educational benefits of the kids aren't going to change one iota what the ceiling is made out of. Just, I don't know, somebody else step in. Mike, shut up, whatever. It did look nice in the school that we saw. It was beautiful. And this, and I, it, it doesn't have a, an acoustical benefit? Oh, it has a major acoustical benefit, yeah. Yeah, yeah this felt this is behind and, and I think that's one of the biggest concerns you've, you've fielded from teachers is the acoustics in the cafeteria specifically. That with, with, if we're gonna have um, 250 students in a cafeteria at one time. Yeah. 400. 400. 400. Yeah. Okay. Um, you always so. have to go back to that number of students. <laughs> it, it, it's eye-opening. But so that's a that's an important question that we've talked about constantly with teachers. What's that going to look like? What's that going to sound like? Yeah. Is there a sorry? Is there like is there a rating or, or something that you could give us that sense of if we use the acoustical wood ceiling versus something else what is the ceiling time. noise the canceling ceiling. difference yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah there there are acoustic measures and just to be clear I was about to say it's not more necessarily more higher performing than other forms of, of ceiling tile or, or whatever so it's not purely chosen for acoustics it's usually that's your you know your one space so yeah. I'm hearing the comments and we can uh, you know, we can come back with uh, something dialed back and you know, as I recall, I, I, you know, it's a long time ago down at Marathon, though, the ceiling was a regular acoustical ceiling in the cafeteria, but they did a lot with the lighting that made that place special, as I recall. Um, That's where I'll go. Um, of course, the mistake was putting the lighting down at the level for, you know, a first grader could control it. That was a mistake. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'll just that note that, uh, you know, when we talk about cost, we should all talk about Yeah. Acoustical mm -hmm. ceiling right, and then those large there. spaces you actually had a floating acoustical panel, if you will, like because yeah. of those loud spaces with high sure. volume. So when the design team comes back, they should have that opportunity cost of an alternate approach, not just yeah. mm -hmm. it's not a straight division or Right, it's not yeah. yeah. You know, good I mean, the overall cost, it's yeah. a pretty minor number, but we're we're, we're trying to get to keep the number down, not the other no, way. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. You know, it could be an ad alternate, you know, we go out to bid and say, you know, we'll do it with this, but give us a price to do it in wood. And, and if we come in under the number that the, the uh, townspeople vote, then we'll go with we'll it by all means. Just, yeah. All right. There are also, you know, options along Mike's lines. As we go into the pricing exercise in July, yeah. if there are things like this, you want to see what the numbers actually 
actually come back at. This is historical data. You can do actual takeoffs uh, so you know, for select areas. And there should always be punches yeah. in certain areas. You do want to make it feel special as you enter the building. So you know, Great. be judicious with where you spend your money. Yep. Yeah, I guess I, that sorry. That? Part of our thinking too is that Again, if it's if it's all a sea of tile, you yeah. know, ceiling yeah. tile, we're trying not Big to space. have it too institutional yeah. and just be very measured in, in what we introduce. Yeah. But I, I was just going to echo what what Mike said it, it, in terms of the looking at the 180 doesn't feel like as a percentage of the entire project a whole right. lot. But when we're answering to taxpayers who are concerned right. about the overall cost, I think they're going to want to look at what areas could we have saved a little bit. Is there a way to achieve the um, with the acoustical ceiling tile and, and what a little additional soundproofing to achieve the whole thing? And I don't know, is there a way to make that look a little bit better without going to the full 180? Um, <coughs> it would be interesting to see what you can come back with. Yeah, we'll come back. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's it's for us about assessing the alternatives. I know it kind of creates more work for you for for you all, but. It, it's helpful if, if you came back with an alternative and we looked at it and we said, yeah, I think that would feel way too institutional. Maybe that is worth spending the money recognizing this elementary school. At least then we've, we, you know, we can go to the taxpayers and say we've done our due diligence here and we've said, look, we think that this is value add because of the number of students, the type of students, all of those who are going to go through this. So I think that little bit extra work will help us. Absolutely. And I noticed the stage is covered under the painted structure ceiling, which I'm a little curious. I would have thought that would have maybe warranted some acoustic protection, if you will, or not protection, but it is. Yeah, so tectum panels, you can see just above the painted are. structure. Yeah. So tectum panels are a durable acoustic panel that would be used um, as part of the, you know, on stage. Uh, okay treatment we do have an acoustician that would be involved to to look at the space and no matter what material it is you know we'll have to be responsive to make sure it's a functional space so that it works for its intended purpose yeah most stages that from platforms and stages don't actually have acoustical materials on them they are generally the they have the curtains but they are usually in structure of a and the cafeteria space given 400 children at a time how it's subdivided, how the space is broken up, probably has more value than a lot of the other spaces in terms of how the ceiling affects the overall space because it is both a very large space and a very loud space. So the choices that get made in the materials can have wide ranging effects on how that space is for the average student and also how that space could be for the special needs student who may have trouble in a loud, difficult, crowded environment sure. so um, question uh, yes. sorry on a similar team theme to the discussion that we've been having for the classrooms I see we call out a high performance acoustical ceiling tile yeah. Yeah. So high performance all, could also imply a premium product so is there are there other options no actually I'm glad you brought that up it's it's meeting the acoustic yeah. requirements that are necessary in classrooms there are um, properties within the room that include the ceiling as well as the, the built walls to have a, a it's called an STC a sound transmission coefficient uh, of 45 I believe is the number between rooms yeah and, and the, the ceiling tile has a, um, two different two other ones called a CAC and I think it's an NRC um, noise reduction coefficient and those they have to meet a certain requirement to meet the basic lead level. Okay. So if you don't, and if you don't meet that, that's actually a, let's say, a prerequisite. So if we don't meet a prerequisite, we don't get any points in that category. So we're kind of stuck with a ceiling tile that meets that requirement. But it's a good point because um, it used to be called high performance, and now it's the code required it's a minimum tile. It's a classroom. <laughs> and, and and I, I think it can't be lost that. Um, we're not just providing that to meet lead, we're providing that to create an acoustic environment appropriate for teaching that many classrooms of students close to each other so that the students in that classroom can hear just their lesson and not the lesson next door or the meeting that's next door or the conference room next door. It's really to provide the right environment that the MSBA is promoting for those students. Thank you. 
moving from ceiling to wall. So we talk about the wall. We're, we're also incorporating the wainscot as well. Um, so painted drywall. Um, it's, we, we're, we still do two layers, basically, because that provides the longevity and the durability. Yeah. Um, it makes it impact resistant. Um, and different. the sound transmission, too. Yeah, sound transmission. It's a big deal. Yeah. Um, so different than a, a typical home construction of, of drywall. Yeah. Um, there are also premiums you could pay for the type of drywall. There's abuse resistant, which we don't need because we have the two layers required. Um, so that's that prevents like impact. And then there's a scratch resistance uh, surface on drywall, so you can pay a premium so that it doesn't scar or scrape. But what instead is provided, um, we'll have uh, drywall walls in office areas, protected areas, and whenever we're in a corridor or, or traffic area, there'll be a wainscot that protects the wall. You mentioned premium. Is it double the cost when you add in the best of the it's best? It's not double the cost. A lot of the cost of drywall is the Installation and the you know the skim coating and all Taking. the process of putting up the drywall. So it's just a material upcharge. It, it's so. often lost on people because um, they hear, oh, there's an abuse resistant one. Why don't I just use that? One of the reasons you don't use it is because it weighs almost twice as much mm -hmm. as a normal sheet of drywall and requires two guys to put it in place where one guy could put in the regular sheet. And <clears throat> labor is one of the biggest factors that goes into construction. And so if you are doubling the labor for every sheet of drywall that can really add up very quickly. And that, that usually ends up actually being the factor that makes it more expensive. So the wainscot becomes a more durable long-term product that isn't, like not only will you not worry about holes in the walls, but you're, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a more resilient surface that can clean up better. Um, you're not gonna repaint tile. So the long-term operating costs of that wainscot can be much more valuable because as I'm sure any of the educators in the room will tell you, when you're talking about second, third, and fourth graders, anything from about here down is going to get touched a lot. <laughs> yeah, and just to be clear, we're not suggesting we pay the premium. Uh, the double layers are required, so that takes away the need for the abuse resistant. And we'll be using a protective wainscot for um, the high traffic areas, um, which is that next column. So you can see the, the cost um, uh, painted drywall above a certain height, maybe four feet, porcelain tile below that in the corridors. Uh, it's durable, it can be done with uh, very tight joints as well because we want to minimize mortar. Um, very low maintenance um, and, and high durability. Um, there's also painted CMU walls as an option. Uh, I was saying the majority of the interior construction is not built that way, but for some areas, like uh, the uh, group toilet rooms or the stairwells, uh, the gymnasium, and probably the cafeteria, those are prime for uh, kind of a, an epoxy painted drywall. Um, so we'll see that on the next slide. And then ceramic tile used in, in those, uh, select, potentially used in those, uh, in select toilet rooms, possibly single user toilet rooms that might be made of drywall and would have ceramic tile as a protective finish. So, so the last two are split like the second option? Or are they complete that the whole wall is CMU? There's no painted drywall above that like you have in the second example. Right, the whole wall is CMU. Mm -hmm. yeah. It actually becomes. There's a lot of that within the school. It becomes somewhat expensive to stop CMU at a certain height because then you have to laterally brace it. Okay. That's so, what I was wondering. Yeah. You didn't carry that through because so that would be true for the tile as well then. Yeah. yeah, tile is just a surface on top of either the CMU, which is kind of redundant, or <coughs> on top of drywall um, to create that wet wall protection. Part of the upcharge for the tile is that it is on another wall surface. Mm, yeah. And so you're not just paying for the application of the tile, but you're also buying a wall behind it. So it yeah, and these costs include the, the wall and that finish. Um, so we're suggesting um, interior of classrooms and media center and office areas would be the painted drywall. You might say, why a media center? Uh, the majority of the media center is going to be lined with bookshelves and other things that will naturally protect the wall. Uh, there's not a lot of exposed surfaces. It's also a, um, a, a space where uh, there's supervision happening. 
um, guided classrooms um, inside the classroom as well. Um, we are suggesting the corridors, the main lobby, and even into the cafeteria, we'd carry the porcelain wainscot. Um, so uh, this, that's the suggestion there that to protect the drywall. And then painted CMU, as I had mentioned, stairs, gymnasium, and restrooms. So we are actually not, I was mistaken, we are not proposing that at the cafeteria. We're proposing uh, drywall with the, with the uh, porcelain tile. It's a little bit of a better look. You can see it's a dollar per square foot difference, so it's not, not a big delta, but again, that's a, um, a major space that's used for a, a lot of multiple purposes. And from a cleanability standpoint, everywhere you're introducing that tile versus any painted drywall, kids make messes, especially cafeteria, and so that tile, especially at the lower surfaces, is going to make it a lot easier to clean in the long term, which Tim will be very grateful for. Um, and then ceramic tile, that would be the wet walls at, at restrooms um, that were, you know, if they're single user made out of drywall. Um, I'm assuming in these calculations too, we do not have single user that are made, that are CMU. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can see the magnitude of cost. Um, you know, restroom stairs and gymnasium, that's, that's the majority of where the costs are going for the, for the CMU. I guess this is a question for Tim. What did we use for wainscoting at Marathon? I believe it was. Uh, Looked uh, like Formica, yeah, for lack it was of a better product, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It was on top of the two layers, just like yeah, you yeah. described. Yeah. The, the question is how is it held up um, in terms of cleaning and maintenance? Uh, tiles carry with them a whole different thing in terms of custodians or kids chipping corners and, you know. And, and I wonder what the cost difference would be. And I'm not sure why we opted for that in the hallways. The Wayne's so coding. The value engineering, uh, yeah. exercise, the, the time of the funding, uh, original funding approval was a more durable product like it's being presented tonight. And as they had to look at cost alternatives during the balance of design, they went well, the So we, would that material cost more than porcelain tile, Wayne's no, it's less expensive. It's a cost reduction. Less. Yeah. It's a thinner well, layer applied onto the, the surface. Maybe we should look at that. Yeah, did it work? Did it work? I guess that's the question. For now. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're only three, four years into med school. What, uh, minus 2020. Um, well, uh, yeah, so far it's we used a lot of tile in, in Hopkins. I was on that one, too. And, yeah. and the problem going forward and over the years is when tiles crack and got to get replaced, and the stock has long since gone to the dump. It, it, it's difficult to match that stuff. Yes, this stuff, as I recall looking at it, for lack of a better word, looked like Formica. It, had, it came in 8-foot chunks or 12-foot chunks, and they had a strip that, that butted the two together. It had outside corners that matched it. Um, yeah, if you go back to the last slide, it, it talks about the tile was a, you know, has a 50-year lifespan. So yeah. we, uh, we, hear, we can come back and look at that as a, to, to put it in perspective. Yeah. Uh, but the, if the lifespan would be less than half of what's being It's going to be less. Yeah, I mean, and the FRP usually is that's the stuff you see like a Dunkin' Donuts, yeah. like that kind of. Yeah. And we've used it for this purpose before. Um, having seen it been put into the field, it's glued to the wall. Yep. And it, the uh, little strips that hold it together tend to Kids not pull out. to stay right. yeah. in place. Yeah. So they kind of fall well, out. Well, it's important. Out. That's why I asked him. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're five years into that thing. Yeah. We a bunch of little rascals in there destroying the building as we speak. And, and uh, you know, if it, if it hasn't held up, that, that's the end of the argument for me. And uh, just. Let me, um, let me just go and take a, I'll, I'll take a kind of closer look yeah. at it and just make sure, you know, nothing's kind of popping out or I'm not yeah. seeing anything. It, it, it'd be great. Be, it'd be great to know, because yeah. again, there's like ceramic tile, porcelain tile, yeah. and there's this. And yeah. going to town meeting, they, they, it's it, at the end of the day, the kid's gonna get no less education with this than that. So, I ju it'd be great to look at it sure. and let us know what you think. Yeah, if it doesn't work, I'm okay. You yeah. Know, just, yeah. No, it's it's kind of I think a, a newer product to us. We don't have yeah. any of it in any of our other schools. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll take a good close look yeah. at it, make sure it's kind of 
I absolutely agree with the need for rain scoring. There's no question about that. Yeah. It's just about what yeah. it is. And, yeah. and, uh, and I think one of the difference, differences that you have at Hopkins is that ceramic tile, yeah. not as durable mm -hmm. as porcelain tile. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah, that's true too. That was a cost thing at the time. But, yeah. And the, the seam covers on those FRP, once they start to go, yeah. it, it's a slippery slope because yeah. you, one starts to peel, you are, your users are more apt if they're standing next to one that starts to peel to accelerate that process. Yeah. Yeah. And once you expose the seam, it's a downhill slope and you'll have to get a new panel. And unless you're buying the cheapest level of FRP like you'd see in the back of a kitchen, yeah. that whatever's available right now may not be it's something that you can get in the future. And so you're gonna get a faded hallway with one new panel in it and it yeah. it has a its life cycle is not going to fare as well as the tile and even if you can replace it yeah. moving further down to the floor um, gym floor is going to be wood it's we're showing wood That's all the got. guys out there <laughs> told me they won't take anything but wood um, so what we're showing uh, for some floor finishes are linoleum floors. Um, as, a, as an option, we have, I actually have two pages of, of materials. Porcelain tile, which is sometimes a little bit of a dressed up look in lobbies and, and again, durable. Uh, rubber tile floors as an option, um, and uh, which you can see is just a, a slightly above the linoleum. The wood floor that would be used very specifically, um, gymnasium. And, Athletic wood. We also have epoxy floor, so a, a poured epoxy finish, sometimes used in. Oh, sorry, I should be talking about the. Uh, you can see the high durability of all of these. Um, cost per square foot. Linoleum is, is pretty cost effective. Maintenance is uh, medium to low, depending on what the uh, material is, and 30 to 50 year life on, on all of these. Um, the epoxy. Uh, is, is a wider range of 20 to 50 years, probably because of the, the process or the installation. Um, a very high durability and strength. Uh, middle ground as, as far as cost, maybe maybe up a little bit from, um, from some options, um, but less than ceramic tile, which you, you might use for a floor finish. Um, we have rubber treads, which is uh, sometimes used in stairwells. And then we did put VCT on the list because Technically, it would be the most uh, cost-effective. It's also got the shortest life. Um, it's not necessarily a healthy choice and, and requires uh, higher maintenance and the, the waxing and the stripping. Um, but we, we figured we needed to put it on here anyway, uh, just for comparative purposes. Um, what we think would, you know, what we're suggesting might be the way to go is the majority of the school be done with linoleum. Um, so that's classroom, admin, media center, corridor, office suites, uh, cafeteria. Possibly having the more durable porcelain tile only in the heart of the school. Um, rubber tile could be used at the landing of stairs if, if the rubber uh, tread and riser is used on the stair. And then uh, the gymnasium and the stage would receive uh, wood floor. Um, kitchens where and uh, an option for the restrooms would be the poured epoxy. Um, but an alternative for restrooms would be to use a ceramic tile floor. You can see the epoxy would be more cost effective. Um, again, the, the stair treads themselves would be the rubber and not recommending the VCT, the vinyl composition tile. Um, but these were some of our thoughts. Um, flooring is probably probably the most significant set of decisions yeah. to make here. Were, were your suggestions to us, thank you for doing this, it's very clear and easy to understand, uh, were your suggestions to us based on our continuous talking about cost or is this typically what you use in the schools you're working with? It's both actually. Okay. Um, it's it's typical what's used in, in schools, it's got to be durable, it's got to last and it's got to be cost effective. It's a significant, uh, significant pretty, part pretty of the budget. Bold proof, so we don't see a deviation too far off of these. We don't usually see the, you know, some wild dressing up. 
Uh, we do see that in the stair, there are stairs, there are options to go to m more of the exposed concrete stair, not necessarily putting rubber mm -hmm. over it. You can do that. Yep. Um, is is an option, and you can even lim limit that to maybe just vestibules. Although vestibules nowadays are predominantly a form of uh, embedded mat system, mm -hmm. um, so there's really not not much there. But um, there is the option to to not uh, treat the lobby differently. Um, usually the high traffic uh, s highlights the lobby as, as something that would want, want a slightly more durable material. Um, and restrooms could go, restrooms, you know, uh, ceramic tiles, what we see for floors, it's actually a, a smaller tile, um, not loving the grout over time, you know, an epoxy. I'm not sure what you guys used at Marathon. Did, like a mosaic tile. I mean, it's pretty standard, but um, but there are options to, to, to go to an epoxy. But a, a lot of them are fairly straightforward. Um, so, so I think the idea of, of high durability and low cost, it's just it's what we see in, in all projects. Yeah, I appreciate you leaving it on the list for the full array of options, but I, I would just, the VCT can go as far as I'm concerned. It, it doesn't provide a significant, actually I don't think it provides any economic benefit in terms of its how long it lasts as compared to the linoleum and the additional maintenance. So I, yeah, I'd be happy to get rid of that, but um, I don't think I have any other questions other than that. And again, you're not actually choosing, this is yeah. just what we're carrying yeah. in the budget. Yeah. Right, no, 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 I know, but yeah. I mean in terms of like, yeah, as you know, as we think about getting towards where we got to on the exterior <coughs> materials, like the same kind of is this also on the lower end of what the allowance is? It's probably on the, right on. It's probably right on. Yeah, I mean, this this is this are these are really like what we would have carried in yeah. on that that on that stage anyway. For the lower life cycle materials, would we have to carry a replacement cost if it's just twenty years in in the overall budget? Or I mean, we wouldn't carry it in an estimate, no. No, a lot of this is a similar lifespan. Floor finish to floor finish, like some of the tiles, I think may may last a little bit longer, but in general, you're in that same general lifespan. So there isn't the um, let's say the impact that you get from the life cycle cost analysis of some mechanical systems as, as floors. More likely with floors, you're replacing it because of your clientele than because of anything else. It's Alright, so my other examples are if a linoleum is a sheet good, if you've got to fix or repair, mm -hmm. sometimes if it's a rubber tile or a, or a luxury vial tile plank, it's easier to kind of snap those pieces out and put them back in. But other than that, you know, that's the kind of level of maintenance you think for in terms of replacement. Yeah. In terms of time, in terms of time frame on this, so is this will we see the kind of version two or the updates to this at the next meeting and we'll make a similar decision as to the one we made for external materials is that the timeline yeah. Okay. yeah there is also the option with these because the scope is a little a lot more clearly defined mm -hmm. if there was something that we wanted to carry as options or alternates it lends itself to that a little bit more because we're defining a specific area we can just look at the comparative costs of one option versus another. That might work with the FRP, so you can make the judgment of whether you want that. Um, the impact of the longer duration material versus the uh, more cost effective material. Okay, good job. That's it for the formal presentation. Okay. The only thing in the meeting schedule, and um, I think the we've largely wrapped up a lot of our meetings with the, the school entities the, from the focus groups all the way up through the administration. Um, I think the, the thing for the committee to think about, and I know we'll discuss it in the working group, would be additional forums and how we want to communicate a lot of what, the work that we're doing here to the community over um, the coming mm -hmm. next couple of months as we head towards schematic design and also as we begin to move into the fall. Yeah, I think I was I was thinking along similar lines, which is maybe the in the in the working group come up with a proposal for what the forums look like between now and November, and then come back maybe make it an agenda item for our next 
ESBC meeting for the full committee to look at that and approve, if that makes sense. Okay. So I believe that wraps up our agenda. And therefore, I would seek a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I have a motion by Mike and a second by Nancy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are adjourned at 8.05 p.m. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, HCAM. What's new? And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks.